Good evening. Hi, I'm Stan Mark. I'm Vice Chair of Class Act HR 73. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar entitled Beyond the Mission Statement, Financial and Marketing Startup Overview, uh, presented by Martha Stone Martin. Class Act HR 73 was founded 10 years ago, and not long after we developed our bridge program. The bridge program supports class base and the nonprofit organizations they sponsor by matching them with volunteers from the class who donate their expertise to assist these organizations in reaching their goals. Three Class Act board members, Lee Haffrey, Rick Wall, and I oversee the Bridge Program and, and have developed this new webinar series as an outreach not only to our Class of 1973 classmates, but to other classes that have started their own Class Acts and indeed to the whole alumni community. I would now like to introduce our speaker. Martha Stone Martin is Vice President of Marketing and Administration for Charles River CFO. Charles River CFO provides outsourced CFO, accounting, and HR services to nonprofits, biotech, and technology firms. She has over 30 years of experience developing web presences, presences for small firms. In fact, Martha was instrumental in setting up the Class Act HR 73 website with our provider, Wild Apricot. So without further ado, Martha, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Stan. And I just have to say, it's nice to see you and, and Therese again. Um, I knew Marion Dry um, from, we live in the same town, and um, she first came to me 10 years ago and, and shared this sort of great idea that came out of your, I believe it was your 50th or your 40th reunion? 40th, and, yes. Um, 40th. And um, so work with her and, um, you know, saw the project launch and saw the other class acts. And it's it's just a real pleasure to, to be here and, and um, see the success you've had. Um, so a little bit um, more about me. So I had my own firm for about 25 years. And that was the context that I um, knew Marion and work with them to develop websites and other clients marketing presence and things. And four years ago, um, like many people our age, it's time for another act. And um, I went to work for um, this uh, company, Charles River CFO, based in uh, Wellesley. So it's sort of a similar um, path that you all have been following. Um, really, what I want to just quickly start with, sorry, I'm just trying to clear my screen, um, is really a few points about getting started. And I know some of these, if you went to these other webinars that Stan referred to, um, Ulysses have already addressed these, but um, really I, I point you back to the creating the 501c3 and a 10 point plan for board of directors. If you haven't seen those, those are great things um, to go over. Um, I don't know where you're all from and where you are in your journey. So some of this might be uh, too simple. Some of it might not be what you're um, really looking for. So hopefully we'll get some more clarity in the Q&A. Um, it's really important to register in your unique state. I know Massachusetts. I know we've worked with some nonprofits throughout New England and some other parts of the country. But every state is unique in terms of their filing requirements and their compliance requirements. So it's really important once you've decided all your um, you know, basic information to find out on your own state. And it's usually, um, you know, you can just go to the state website and they'll tell you exactly what you need to do there. Um, obviously a strategic plan and, you know, notice I have the lowercase s and the lowercase p. You know, you don't need to have a giant strategic plan all the time. It will evolve and it will get richer and more complex and more detail. But it is always important to have the basics. What your mission is, what your about is, who the main characters are, um, and as much detail as you can about fundraising, what programs you're going to deliver, what value you're adding to your community, why you do it uniquely, how you're going to um, recruit and retain and engage volunteers, they're the sort of bedrock of the success of nonprofits, um, and just overall how you're going to engage with your community. Um, I worked for a while um, in a nonprofit as a marketing director at an organization in Arlington called um, the Children's Room, provides bereavement services for children who have lost a sibling or a parent. And you know, their programs were delivered by volunteers. They went through a special training um, and there was a professional in the room as well. But 
the volunteers were very committed. They stayed for years and years. So, you know, everyone does it differently. Uh, cradles to crayons is another one that, um, you know, they make a big deal about their sorting groups that come in. Their volunteers go into this massive warehouse in, I think, Brighton somewhere. Um, and they're the ones who are sorting and packaging these clothes up to these sort of unique, um, you know, here's like a five outfits for a boy size five, you know, and it's really about how you engage those volunteers in a fun, impactful way that, you know, connects them to your cause. Um, but just some backup. And again, as I said, the, the webinars that Stan referred to are really good places to start. But I want to just jump into some of the um, the financial stuff first. Um, and really, it's really important to right up front have really sound management practices. Um, you might say, well, I'm not a finance person or I don't have that aptitude. I can't even, you know, figure out how to log into my, you know, banking. Um, you have to figure it out because starting well is going to save you a lot of time, a lot of money and a lot of headaches. Um, once you hit and you all want to hit um, that magical $500,000 mark, um, that's what it is in Massachusetts, for example. Um, it, once you hit $500,000 in revenue, you will have to have an audit and you do not want to pay an accounting firm. And it has to be with a CPA firm. Um, doesn't have to be a big four, but they're expensive and the messier your financials are, the worse it gets. So it's really important to figure out the basics and stick with it. Um, right off the bat, have a budget. It All you need is an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet, a little bit more than an envelope. And, you know, it just needs to have maybe 20 lines, you know, what you expect from income. And we're going to talk a little bit about income, where it comes from, whether it's grants, whether it's um, donation, are they restricted grants, are they unrestricted, is it earned income, a couple of different categories of revenue, what are your costs, and get in the habit right up front about always thinking about your costs in terms of your programs you deliver. It's just really important to get that headset. Don't lump all your costs as one, like here's all my salaries, here's all my fringe benefits. Really think about it as what programs does this nonprofit do? Do we do, we do outreach? Do we do feeding programs? Do we do music programs? And make sure that the costs associated with them are identified. Um, so keeping your budget, you know, income, then you have your costs, and then you'll have your overhead costs, like, you know, your other salaries. But, um, you know, keep it, keep it on a spreadsheet and get in the habit of doing monthly reports, even if you don't have many changes, but it's just a habit to get into, making sure I, you know, you already have a bank account set up. Um, you want to make sure you reconcile your bank account every month, even if it's you have two entries, you know, you cash two checks or you made two payments, reconcile them, get in the habit, run a little, do a little Excel report, send it to your board of directors or to your staff or to yourself, label it. It's the month. It's just good habit to get into um, and it will set you up in the future. Make sure you have internal controls. Um, and really in the beginning, it's mostly around things about your bank account. Um, when you open a bank account, as you know, anywhere in America, you, you know, one person has to put their name on it, you know, and there's got to be a social security number assigned to that bank account. That's just part of the whole um, Homeland Security Act. And, but you want to have, you know, banks will allow you to have two users. So you always want to have two users on your bank account. That's how you prevent, you know, just, you know, something that might be missing or somebody overlooks something. You want to think about if you're the kind of nonprofit that might shell out big checks, not many, not often, but big, you want to determine what level of signature authority is in place. You know, anything over $500 or $1,000 needs two signatures. You know, those seem very basic, but if you get in the habit of doing those kind of basic internal controls, um, it'll serve you well. Um, you know, when you get into things like a more robust um, accounting system, you will think about things like chart of accounts. Um, 
you know, getting into more detail about how to code uh, expenses. And it doesn't, there's not really a right way or wrong way. I mean, we all have our own filing systems we do digitally, you know, whether it's the, the year, the month, the name of an expense, what program it's for, just, you know, come up with whatever your sort of um, coding is going to be. Um, and it will just go a long way as you get more complicated. Um, make sure you understand what compliance um, issues that you're going to face based on the size you are. Do you need to file a 990? 990 is an annual um, document that's required by the IRS um, for any 501c3 exempt um, nonprofits that also, you know, you have to double check, but it used to be $200,000 in revenue. You have to, by law, file a 990. Your states have filing requirements as well. So just be on top of those. Don't miss them. Um, it's just figure out what the costs could be to <clears throat> do those filings and plan that in your budget. Um, it's fine, you know, start your business on Excel or Google Sheets. I started my business on Excel, did it for three years. You know, it's fine. Um, as long as you have um, that ability to just um, capture everything. Um, but generally the next best place to go is QuickBooks, um, QuickBooks Online. It's uh, the gold standard for accounting systems for um, small businesses, small nonprofits, small businesses, very reasonably priced. Lots of templates, lots of tools, lots of simplified things. And you can stay with it. I mean, you know, our company is still on QuickBooks. Um, you know, companies going up to $10 million are still using QuickBooks. So you have a long ramp there in terms of once you get to QuickBooks. Um, but you don't need to start with that. You know, an Excel or Google Sheets is more than adequate for that. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit more about um, so those elements of a budget. Um, income is the top line. It's the most important thing. And income comes from different places. And again, when you're thinking about a budget, it's good to think about what are your income sources. Um, and they vary. Um, and you will put your energies into different buckets, depending on what you're doing. Everyone doesn't do all of these equally. Um, obviously, donations is is the one that most people think about. You know, you um, you ask people for donations. You um, do email campaigns, annual you know annual fundraising do drives. Um, those are just donations to your nonprofit. Um, that is one category of income. Another one is grants. That's a, probably the second biggest one that you might um, be tapping into. And there are grants everywhere. I mean, you can just, you know, drive into Google. Um, there are resources, consultants that can help you sort of um, source different grants. But um, there are just millions of dollars available. Um, and yes, you're writing grants. You have to be comfortable writing. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to sort of some things to always have handy to make grant writing really easy. Um, earned income, that's when you actually are, uh, you're receiving funds in exchange for something. Um, you're selling t-shirts, um, you're doing a fundraising drive and you're, um, you know, selling t-shirts, that's earned income, um, that you gave somebody something, a goods or service, and you got money back. Um, so that's another bucket. One of the things to be very mindful of is you get into grants and you start receiving grants, they generally fall into two categories, unrestricted and restricted. Super important to understand that up front and make sure you have your accounting set up for it. A an unrestricted grant is they basically are just giving you some money. We believe in your cause. Here you go. There is no restrictions on how you use it. A restricted grant is um, tied to either a certain program, a certain set of deliverables, like Class Act might get um, a restricted grant to fund the webinar program. That is a restricted grant. Those funds can only be used for the webinar program. And you can only recognize that revenue um, when those costs 
occur. So you can't even sort of recognize it as revenue. You get a, you know, if Stan gets a $500,000 grant from somebody to, um, you know, put on 15 webinars, wouldn't that be nice? Um, you can't recognize that as income in immediately. It, it's recognized as the sort of deliverables occur. You have to sort of match the revenue in the same time period as the expenses. So really important when you're thinking about grants, you know, really they'll tell you, but you have to be mindful um, because the accounting is different. Um, make sure you're um, allocating the expenses properly. It's again, even if you're just simply, you get a receipt, you do something, just come up with a coding with, you know, the year, the date, the program name that that expense goes to, um, and then it's easy to keep track of them. Um, all most grants allow you to have um, an overhead percent rate, um, so that you can apply some of your overhead to to the grant. Um, there's all sorts of very specific rules about overhead rates. Um, we could, I just work with one of our accountants to do a very specific, you know, four page paper on it. Um, and if you get government grants, each agency has different requirements. If you get a grant from the State Department versus a grant from the National Science Foundation versus, you know, NIH, um, they all have different um, ways they uh, calculate and allow you to calculate overhead uh, rate to your program costs. But again, if you have a pretty good budget, you're starting that headset off right away, you'll be able to track and understand what's truly overhead and what belongs in a program bucket for costs. Um, last thing, whoops, sorry, I have to keep moving my my speaker view up and down um, so I can see my slides. So last thing is just, as I said before, is really get in the habit of reconciling every month your bank account, um, any um, all your expenses, all your costs. You don't have to go through closing your books officially, but just have a good sense of this month, this is what income we had, this is what expense we had. And you know everything's in that month that should be in that month. And just do a little Excel report. Once you get to QuickBooks, all that is much easier, but um, it's more of a, a discipline. At, at, at a startup level. Um, once you get um, a bigger and you hit that revenue size, it, you're expected to follow what's called generally accepted um, accounting procedures, GAP, um, and you are required to have an audit to show that you are doing the proper ways to um, account for grants and expenses and overhead rates. Um, but in the beginning, as long as you just kind of be mindful of what your spending buckets are, you'll be in good shape. Um, fundraising, just briefly, um, fundraising is, it changes, of course, um, depending on what your mission is, what you want to do, um, who your audience is. And that's where it's really important to go back to your, your strategic plan, even if it's a small one, but really understand who your audience is and what they want. Um, and that will help define who you want to talk to to raise funds. But generally, most people start with friends and family. You know, you have a really good idea. Um, and those people then introduce you to other people in sort of small groups. You try and look at people who have um, a same vision as you do for whatever your nonprofit is and what impact you hope to have in what community. Um, we already spoke about the grants. But... Um, joint events is another good way for fundraising with um, a community partner that may or may not be complementary, but you could still be in the same physical community or the same like Harvard community. You know, it doesn't have to be physically, but, you know, so you could look to um, leaders in in your community, however you define it, um, and see what they're already doing and seeing if you can join with them. Um, to do something is a great way to get started when you're when you're small. Um, somebody's having a big gala, um, and you you know connect with them, and and they see your um, mission and programming as as complementary to theirs. You might say, "Can we do a little balloon auction while while you're doing your gala event?" You know, so this 
different things like that. Could we sell t-shirts at your fundraising um, road race? Um, so be creative about that. Um, most people understand sort of annual campaigns. Um, they work when you have start having a database of, of, pretend, of donors in the past um, or people who have joined your newsletter. Um, but that takes a bit of a uh, ramp to, to get going before you have enough people um, that you can really rely on just annual campaigns. Um, but it is really important once you have donors to connect with them. Donors like to know that they're having an impact and that the money that they've invested in you is having the impact that you said it would. So it's really important and it can be, um, you know, an all hands on deck. When we, when I worked at this nonprofit, you know, it was sort of a tiered effect. You know, some people took the top 5% donors, the next person took the top 10% and, you know, all the way down and, you know, this different level of touch point, but really need to curate and stay in connection with your donors on a regular basis. Um, just seeing how I'm doing time. Um, it's important to think of some KPIs, you know, um, you don't think of that necessarily as a nonprofit. It tends to be more in the, you know, for-profit world, but it's, it's really good to come up with, you know, three, five, not many, um, key performance indicators that you look at every month. And again, you start it off in the beginning and it'll become a habit. You'll just have your little summary report. Here's our three KPIs and they'll change. You know, we change ours every year. You know, we keep keep a core and, you know, add one, throw some away depending on what we've achieved. But even as simple as what, how much money you're raising and what's the growth in that? Like, it's not necessarily just that you had three huge windfall donations. It's also what's the, how is the growth of your donor base? You need both, okay? You obviously need the lump sum just to get your revenue, but um, just track that. Um, as you start doing events, events can be big cost. Um, while they're good for fundraising, they also can be um, a big uh, use of cash. So it's really important to understand what did you get from that big event? And if, if it's not there, the return on investment, then don't do it again. Um, so, you know, be, keep track of, of that. Cash flow, um, you know, is really important. You always have to know how much cash you have on hand, um, especially if you get into programs and if you hire people, um, you know, if people, you're paying people salary, you, you know, you have to have three months of cash on hand, you know, minimum. And if you if you have a big fluctuation in your in your income streams, then you might need more, you know, um, on ramp or in cash flow. So just really important to keep an eye on your cash and how much you got versus how much you need each month. Um, what is your operating surplus or deficit? So if I have my all my revenue and took out all my expenses, do I have a surplus or a deficit? If you have a surplus, you're not doing enough. And if you have a deficit, it means you got to go fundraise some more. I've got my sort of time, so I'm going to switch to marketing real quickly. Um, marketing is purely about communication and connection, okay? Go back to your strategic plan and really understand your audience and what is it that they want. What are they what do they want from you in terms of understanding that um, that deliverable, that impact? Refine your mission statement to an elevator pitch. You want two pieces of in your Google Docs or your Word. You want to have your elevator pitch and you want to have a five second one, a 30 second one and a 90 second one. What do you say when someone says, oh, what do you do? You have to make that perfect and once it's done, you'll be amazed how many times you tap into that document and say, oh, someone needs a description, someone needs that. And then the second document is your about, and that's a little bit more information and maybe talks about your programs. But have those documents done, you will use them all the time. Um, try chat GTP. I don't know who else who's used it out here. I use it a lot. Um, it is a great way to start writing. And especially when it's your content, but you, you'd be amazed, you know, you just say, uh, help me write a mission statement about delivering um, musical lessons to um, kids in the mountains uh, on snowy afternoons. 
you know, you'd be amazed what might come up. So try it as a, as a sort of prompt when you get stuck with sort of writing anything. Um, your board of directors are your sort of key people to start reaching out to your audiences. Um, technically, it's really important right away. I kind of go back and forth between high and low level here, but open up a Gmail account and make it a forwarding account. It's Trust me, it's going to be one of the basic things that you'll be thankful that you did. So it doesn't even matter what it is, you know, come up with some name. You're going to forward it to whoever's your four board members or three board members. I think in the beginning when we did it for Class Act, it went to five board members and probably only goes to Diana now. But you will use that in different ways because the next thing you're going to do is opening up lots of tools and accounts. And you do not want them in someone's personal email address. A Gmail address that you set up, it's generic, doesn't matter. It's going to be nonprofit X52346. You know, it's not going to be visible anywhere. And it's forwarded to blank, blank, blank. And you can change your forwarding all the time. But if you start opening up a domain under Mar M. Stone Martin and M. Stone Martin leaves or my email changes, you're really kind of, you know, in trouble there. So use a Gmail account. Um, let's talk quickly about brand elements, um, logo. Um, people think you got to have a logo right away. Yes, you can also change your logo. It's no hard, firm rules, but it's a good idea. Um, a logo is really four things. It's whatever graphics, it's your font choices, it's your colors you like, and it's a tagline or not. But really think about your audience and what's what are you trying to convey? Think about fonts. How is that going to resonate? You're targeting a younger crowd? Better use some fresher fonts. Um, what colors? It can be as simple as, I don't like these colors. Because even if you, if you try and uh, work with an outside designer, you're going to waste a lot of expensive hours, um, having them come back and forth with lots of ideas. So the more you tell them, I like these three fonts, I like these five colors. I think for graphical images, I'm thinking um, we're doing something around nature. I think trees, I think leaves, I think colors of greens and browns. The more you tell them, the better you're going to get and faster you're going to get something you like. Um, I have a couple of resources here that are great um, color ideas if you're stuck. Um, and then I would consider, I don't know if you've all heard of Upwork, it's a great freelance website. I've used it for decades to find um, talent. Um, or there's another site I've used called 99designs. Um, they'll get you um, a number of um, logo designs for two or $300. Um, so both of those are good to check out. Um, Upwork um, is international. You can narrow what you're looking for just to US. You can narrow it. You're going to pay more money. You can go offshore and you're going to pay less money. It's all a trade off. Um, just really look for the numbers of projects people have completed, the reviews, and then, um, you know, how they respond to what your specs are. Uh, website is three big things in a website the content, you know, the words you got there. The design, you know, how's it look, the graphics, the feel, and the functionality. So what is it doing? Is it just, um, are you collecting email addresses for a newsletter? Are you collecting content um, or contact forms? Are people giving donations? You know, what, what functionality? So think about that for a while. Look at your top 10 lists, top 10 favorite uh, websites out there. Print them out. Circle them saying, I like this on this. I like this on that. Um, develop 10 key phrases that represent your work, uh, musical instrument or music lessons for free, um, for, you know, Denver city kids, um, because that will help your copy development and that's what helps your SEO. So search engine optimization. So if somebody is looking for after school music programs for free in Denver, you want your website to come up. It's not going to come up unless you have that phrase in there. It matches it or, you know, the contextual mapping that Google does now. It's not necessarily an exact one. Um, think about the design elements of your website. You have a logo. You might have your colors. Think about photos. Um, photo shoots can, you know, where you're going to get your sort of imagery. You can do a photo shoot um, or there's a couple of free websites out there you can um get um, free photos. I've listed a few here, but do pay attention to the attrition. Some of them you have to um, actually, you know, somewhere 
um, note who was the photographer. Some of them you don't, but they but they do offer pretty good free um, images. But to be honest, if you go to an iStockphoto.com, you can say, I just need 15 photos from my website to do beautiful banner images. And you can only spend 30 bucks a photo. You know, it's not, it's not huge money. So you can get beautiful photos, um, you know, do some banners and stuff like that with a, you know, pretty small budget. I think I'm winding down um, website. I have here a bunch of um, platforms. WordPress is the biggest uh, platform out there. WPEngine.com is probably the best place to host it. I got some dollars there. Um, Wix is another popular site. Um, the difference is Wix is um, hosted platform. Um, it's not as easy to move away from Wix. Uh, WordPress, you own it. Pretty much you're kind of managing it. Wix, they provide all sorts of handle on. They do all the backup for you. It's a great site to use. Um, Wild Apricot, um, that's a, another one um, that we use for a class act. Um, it's a more expensive one, um, but it has, it's a, a comprehensive. It's a website, it's a fundraising, it's an event manager, it's an email thing all bundled in. And it can be a good fit um, at the low end. When you start getting really big, it will become more expensive and you will go, you will go to WordPress eventually. <laughs> All right, I think I have to stop now. Let me just see if there's any. Um, I have a couple other resources there. Um, Mass Nonprofit Association is great. Um, you should go check it out. You can join for like 50, 70 bucks and they have terrific resources. Um, I'm gonna skip through that. Um, key marketing performance indicators, web visitors, your social analytics, email list size, volunteers, events. And I think that's it. Martha, thank you. Uh, let's open it up for Q&A right now. I'm sure everybody has some questions. My, my one question is, you kind of address how much it costs. When do you know that you need these, these things? And uh, what's the process of engaging somebody like yourself or one of the, um, the, the web vendors? Um, Martha, how would you handle that? Um. So you'll need somebody when you want a website. Um, you can, Wix is pretty pretty easy to start. A lot of people like Squarespace. I wouldn't recommend it. It's too low end. You're going to quickly move, want to move out of it. So, um, you know, you can right away, um, you know, open up a Wix account, um, even a WordPress account, and they have great templates. It's just really your aptitude. If you have somebody that's... Um, connected to you that can go in and create a five page website. Um, you don't need coding skills. Um, that's a place you can start or those um, Wix provides, you know, people who will help you. And that Upwork I referenced, you can find a developer on there um, who will help you as well. Okay, that's for website. I'll call on Teresa in a second. But what about the whole engagement with all the different things that you've uh, described? Um, how long does it take? <laughs> I know it's specific to the organization. What is the kind of, is it a one month thing that they, you know, you get started and then you hand it off or is it an ongoing thing or six month thing? Um, how um, do you... To do a website, you should really think four months. Mm -hmm. um, you would, the, there's a lot of planning up front. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of back and forth and just the reviews time takes longer than you think you get into vacations etc cetera, etc cetera. but and generally a four month is a good planning window correct therese do you have a question I do. Me, yeah. I do and i have a couple of questions related to the board how do you determine early on what sort of board contributions you feel you need to make the organization run because often it's like the contri initial contributions of a board that can get you going. Sometimes, what if you don't have any board commitment? What is the responsibility of the board to help you in the fundraising process? That varies. I mean, it just, it, it does just vary. The bigger boards, there is a expectation of a commitment, a financial commitment. Um, you know, it, it, that just really, I mean, I, as I said, I um, am aware of an organization about, you know, million, million and a half budget. 
and their board members were, I believe, in about the $5,000 expectation. Another organization is much, much smaller, a couple hundred thousand, and there's no specific. Um, it's just what you can do. So it just depends on what you want. But how much? Did you also, sorry. How much did you rely on the board to help you in your fundraising goals, especially a when lot. That's what they're there for. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, that I think the the answer to your question too is is think of the board also as just functional expertise. You know, there's a financial and there's also a functional, and you just want to make sure you're balanced. You know, you have somebody that might be legal, somebody who might be financial, somebody who might be marketing, um, somebody who might be technical. You know, would be in that, and then somebody from the community. You know, whatever your community you're reaching out to as well. You know, that would be a perfect board. <laughs> Wonderful. Ron? Thank you very much. That was really excellent. Um, can you give us a few examples of how you can use uh, chat GPT or an AI um, for fundraising? Well, I wish I could open it up right now. You should. Uh, all I'm <laughs> saying, definitely. Do you have an account? Open yes. an account. Um, mm -hmm. I would just sort of say, what are the five? It's all about the query, right? As you know, what are the five best fundraising activities for a nonprofit less than one million in the blank field? See what you get. Okay. And just keep, uh -huh. it's really about the querying. I mean, I did it for this presentation. What are the top 10 things um, a startup, startup nonprofit should do? Boop, 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 but like in, you know, seconds. I'm like, oh, that's yes. a good way of saying okay. that. I like the way that is, you know, it's just a fresh. So, I mean, just keep playing with the querying um, because those examples are perfect for chat GTP because that data is out there on the internet by gob. So go and suck it up and give it to me succinctly, you know? I like that idea. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, Lori. That was wonderful. Thank you, Martha. Question for small nonprofits in remote areas. I know you focused and revolved around the idea of the relationship with the bank. What about nonprofits that are given virtual currency or some complicated source of financing by a donor? How do they? You mean like Bitcoin? Yes, exactly. Cryptocurrency. I'd run away myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Go ahead. Man, that's complicated. Um, you know, fungibles and, and Bitcoin, and I'm not qualified to answer. Um, I, uh, you really need to uh, maybe start with your bank and ask them because, um, you know, the whole issue with that is it's, it's, it's how much is that worth? And then how do you actually tap into that funds, right? Um, you know, like if someone gives you a, a you know, Bitcoin, um, you know, you you want the cash, you've got to access it. Um, so it's complicated. We have time for one more question. And this is from Jim Rhodes. How important is it to have a financial, quote unquote, expert on the board? If you zero to... 10,000, 25,000, 50,000, you're probably fine. But beyond that, you really, um, you need to, particularly when you get around these grants, um, it's really important to understand how to track expenses and account for revenue. Um, and you can get that, you know, you can outsource it. I mean, that's what we do. And I mean, this isn't a pitch, but there are lots of organizations that specifically even do it for nonprofits. Um, but you definitely need somebody who understands um, the proper accounting for nonprofits and compliance, because you cannot afford a $25,000 audit. Or, or if you can, you don't want to spend $25,000 on an audit because, you know, everything's kind of, you know, they have to redo everything or you get, you get a, um, a bad, um, signature on they, they, they're, you're unauditable or something like that. You know, it's really a black mark. Super. Anybody have a last minute question before I close? And one more. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Did uh, Teresa want to go first? No, 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 I've already asked a question. You've already asked a question. Okay. Uh, this is, I believe I've asked it in an earlier one of our sessions on uh, financing by uh, 
affiliate 501c3 relation, contractual relationships. I understand that there are some 501c3s that will provide financing to uh, an entity for a not-for-profit type of purpose, even if the not the the entity that's being financed is not in fact a not-for-profit entity and is not a 501c3 itself. Uh, are, is, is there a website that or any other public source that a company can go to 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 identify these possible sources of financing uh, for companies that are not in fact not-for-profits? So these these are not nonprofits but are looking for financing for nonprofit from. financing it's cuz there's a, i've forgotten the t the term it's a contractual for the affiliate financing it's a 501 yeah. some 501c3 oh, fiscal will sponsor finance. fiscal sponsor fiscal sponsor thank you yes that's yeah. the term um i don't have i don't have that i'd have to ask like our cfo for that information but again um i would try chat gp just to see what you get Say, point me to in the I somewhere on the irs.gov that explains blank. Like, tell it where to go. Tell it to go to a reputable site, or um, go look on um, the big four accounting firms. Um, um, you know the, you know they all have nonprofit areas, and sort of search on their websites in their articles. They'll they'll have resources and things that could be another place to start. Uh, Therese? Uh, my question relates to grants, which are labor intensive to write and labor intensive to report on. How do you, as a startup nonprofit, sort of budget time wise for what that takes? If you're successful getting a grant, that reporting part is very difficult. Well, one of the things I, you know, I briefly covered is, is have that sort of stock of documents that are just boilerplate for you like it will speed up your your um grant writing when you you, you have your your you know the, the the staff bios when you have the the about they have your program you know like those nuggets of information don't be rewriting that stuff all the time um uh you know it's just really being having a good calendar and seeing what to do when and just try and kind of spread it out and stay on top of it. But if you have grants that are requiring reporting, it's just not much, you know, you know, the, the more you have, that's, if you have sizable grants, you know, I hope, are you using something like a QuickBooks now or yeah, some sort of account? Like specifically to the reporting function, which can take up a lot of time. Yeah. Because they, they'll have some reporting, at least on the financials, you know, that you can do by program or by grant, you know, identifying um, the grant expenses. Um, but I, I don't, there's no quick, easy way to do it other than um, having a, as much as you can in sort of template form for things that are standardized across different grant reports. Martha, thank you. And thank, to, you know, thank you. to everybody for the great questions. Class Act is pleased they have embarked on this new venture. If you have any ideas for topics helpful to nonprofit organizations for future webinars, or would like to volunteer as a presenter or suggest a presenter, please email us at classacthr73 at gmail.com. Sorry, dot com. We would love to partner with other Class Acts and alums. So that, that closes this evening's presentation. Thank you. Good evening. See you next month. Thank you, Martha. Thanks, Martha. Bye. Thank you very much.